the Shroud of Turin. In 1988, carbon dating revealed it was a fake. But now, at the end of his life, one scientist claims he's uncovered new evidence that the shroud may be real. I think I can come very close to proving that it was used to bury the historic Jesus. On October 8, 1978, in the Italian city of Turin, an unprecedented event took place. The Shroud of Turin, one of the most mysterious objects in the Western world, was finally going to be examined by scientists. For 120 hours, the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STIRP, would run thousands of tests on this sacred 14-foot piece of linen, believed by many to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. We opened up Pandora's box and created a whole new group of questions. Many worried that what they would find might rock Christianity to its core. It's like the courtroom drama will say, it's real and this is Jesus, or it's not and it's a hoax and you've all been defrauded and by implication, religion and faith are a joke. One of the leading members of the STIRP team was Ray Rogers, a highly respected chemist from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Rogers was a man of science, not God, and yet he was absolutely captivated by the shroud. For him, it was a great mystery waiting to be unraveled. I don't believe in miracles that defy the laws of nature. The scientific journey that brought Rogers and dozens of other scientists to the Shroud of Turin began with an amateur photographer, Secundo Pia, who in 1898 took the very first photo of the Shroud. A photo that revealed something no one had ever seen. When Secundo Pia makes this photograph, he almost dropped the plate. It scared him because he said, my God, I was looking into the face of the Lord. The image on the shroud was very faint, but Pia's photographic negative brought a face into stark relief. It was the first real evidence there was more to the shroud than the naked eye could see, and it caused an uproar. He's immediately accused of fraud, immediately accused of cheating, lying, and manipulating this. It's a fake. And it wasn't until 1931 when Giuseppe Henrié is allowed to photograph the shroud for the second time. Gets the same results, of course. The world of science suddenly looks at the shroud and says, well, wait a minute, maybe we should look at this closer. But scientists were not given the opportunity to look more closely at the shroud. Another 40 years would pass before they made another major breakthrough using a new high-tech image analyzer called a VP8. Peter Schumacher was a field engineer for the team that created the VP-8, which was originally designed to analyze images from medical resources and satellites. Nobody in our company had ever even heard of the Shroud of Turin, let alone seen pictures or wanted to look at image analysis of the Shroud of Turin. What the VP-8 analyzer does is plot the light and dark areas of an image onto a 3D grid. In the mid-70s, two American scientists, Eric Jumper and Joe Jackson at the U.S. Air Force Academy, heard about this new technology and asked Schumacher to use it to examine a photograph of the shroud. We asked Schumacher to recreate that test for us so we could see exactly what it was that excited shroud scientists 30 years ago. We placed three images under the analyzer a self-portrait of the great master Leonardo da Vinci, a photograph of one of our crew members, and the 1931 photograph of the Shroud of Turin. First, Schumacher examined the charcoal self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci to show how the analyzer reacts to a drawing or painting, which some have argued is exactly what the Shroud of Turin is. If it was painted, it would look like the da Vinci, which 
came out basically looking like noise. It's a fairly bland contrast. Next, we wanted to see what a regular photograph looked like under the VP-8. So we tested a picture of one of our crew members. If we look, Jim's cheeks really aren't that flat. His eyebrows are not really grooved into his forehead. His nose really doesn't smear all over his face. This is what every photograph looks like under the VP-8. It is not rendered with real height or depth, the things that make up a true 3D image. But when a picture of the shroud is placed under the analyzer, something remarkable happens. All of a sudden, we're seeing contrast that has something to do with height and depth, real distance. The nose has a prominence. The cheeks roll off. The hair has a, a shape to it and is rounded. The uh, whole image has dimension to it. Schumacher's results deepened the mystery, started by Secundo Pia. How had this image formed on the shroud? The shroud is a very unique image, the only one of its kind in the whole world. Nothing else like it. Three-dimensional relief, the front and the back of a whole human being. Only one in the world, no other. Nowhere, no how, no way. I don't know any way to make it. I've never heard of a way to make it. Just the Shroud of Turin. Armed with these results, Jumper and Jackson formed STIRP in 1977 and began the delicate dance of gaining access to the Shroud. The VP-8 was the catalyst that caused the formation of the STIRP team. They said, we should see if we can figure out how this image was formed. The biggest problem has always been access to the cloth itself. In the spring of 1978, despite the resistance of many in the Vatican, the church said yes. The church took a relatively enlightened view about the shroud. They have a lot of folks who believe, in fact, that it is truly the burial shroud of Christ and don't want anybody meddling with it. The other side of the coin is that if we don't let the scientists look at it, we'll never know what the truth is. Finally, when we were given our permission to examine the cloth, that science, for the first time really in history, could apply the real scientific method, not just photographs. In order to get access, Sterp could not propose any tests that would mark or cut pieces from the shroud. All these tests had to be non-destructive. Most of the local folks really didn't like us messing around with this holy object. The STIRP team was only given five days to examine the shroud. They worked, literally, around the clock to find out how the haunting image got on the cloth. Barry Schwartz was one of the few photojournalists permitted to record the event. There were spectral analyses done. Sam Pellicori had a spectrophotometer with him that he was using. There were a mosaic of photographs made. It was photographed with ultraviolet fluorescence photography. It was x-rayed using x-ray fluorescence and reflectance imaging. Ray Rogers' tests found that there were no pigments, no dyes, no binding agents typical of paint of any kind on the main body of the shroud, meaning the shroud could not have been painted or drawn But the most fascinating revelation of all was the story told by the bloodstains on the shroud. When someone is tortured, as the Bible tells us Jesus was during his crucifixion, red blood cell walls are ruptured, releasing hemoglobin into the body. The hemoglobin is quickly broken down, creating high levels of bilirubin, and the wounds begin to clot. Sterp's analysis showed the stains on the shroud were these blood clot secretions with extraordinarily high levels of bilirubin, exactly consistent with the trauma of crucifixion. Then there was the ultraviolet fluorescence photography that revealed one more incredible clue hidden from the naked eye. 
You can visually see these serum stains around the blood stains that were never visible until our team photographed the shroud with UV fluorescence photography approximately 2,000 years after this man ostensibly was, was killed. Serum is the liquid component of blood. Composed mostly of water, the stains were invisible on the shroud until ultraviolet light made them appear fluorescent. No medieval artist could have anticipated the invention of ultraviolet fluorescence photography and said, well, I'm going to hide this serum stain and 700 years from now, they'll find it. Give me a break. <laughs> Sterp had set out to determine how the image on the cloth had been created, but they were unable to find the answer. We have an image that modern science, with all of its techniques and technology, and by 78 standards, we had the best that there was, couldn't answer the simple question, how does that image get on that cloth? Ray Rogers and the Sterp team finished their research on the Shroud of Turin with more questions than answers. For if this was not a painting, how had the image formed on the cloth? If the blood was real, Whose was it? And how and when had that man died? 2,000 years ago, the Gospels tell us the Roman Empire crucified Jesus of Nazareth. His battered body was then wrapped in a simple burial shroud. For centuries, many believed this 14-foot piece of linen was that cloth, even though there had been very little evidence to substantiate that claim. Even its origin is not known, for the history of the shroud is as mysterious as the image itself. The first record of the shroud, the first place it was displayed, was here in the small French town of Luray, some 1300 years after the time of Christ. In 1536, it was nearly destroyed by a church fire. It was heavily stained by water, Whole sections of it were worn down by human hands that touched it every time it was put on display for the faithful. Nuns from the poor Clare order sewed on a backing cloth to the shroud in order to preserve it. Finally, in 1578, the shroud was brought to its final resting place, Turin, Italy. Over the next four centuries, the church periodically displayed the shroud to the faithful who believed they were looking at the face of their savior. But for modern science, its authenticity was never a question of faith. What mattered were facts. Sterp, the first scientific team to attack the problem, proved that the shroud was not a painting or a dyed relief. But for all their expertise, they could not say how the haunting image had been created. Many Sterp scientists did note, however, that the image was remarkably consistent with crucifixion. The blood stains, the scourging, all seem to suggest the body of a crucified man. But is there any way to scientifically prove this? Crucifixion was a gruesome, drawn out, and painful death, reserved for criminals and the lowest rung of Roman society. You weren't nailed up there to kill you, you were nailed up to be crucified, tortured. They didn't want you to die right away. In fact, there were evidence that they were surprised that Jesus died so soon. Forensic pathologist Dr. Frederick Zugaby has investigated many gruesome crime scenes in his professional life as chief medical examiner for Rockland County, New York. My area was mechanism, manner, and cause of death and type of suffering the individual had. Dr. Zugaby's fascination with the pathology of crucifixion started in 1948, when he was still a college student. He decided to build his own experiments to investigate the fundamental question. If the shroud had been found at the scene of a crime, would the forensic evidence confirm crucifixion as the cause of death? Okay. When Zugaby started his research, forensic knowledge of crucifixion was almost non-existent. Okay, and how's that? Dr. Zugaby had a cross built so that he could determine how crucifixion actually causes death. 
This experiment would help him analyze the forensic evidence on the shroud. The only available assumption at the time was that the victim suffocated from the weight of his own body, but Zugaby's experiments suggested otherwise. The cause of death was due to shock, which causes failure of the heart as a pump. Of more interest to Zugaby were the nails through the hand. The shroud shows a pool of blood near the wrists of the crucified man. But are human hands nailed to a cross strong enough to support a crucified body? Dr. Zugaby designed special gloves and meters to test the theory. The calculation that we made shows that the palm of the hands would definitely hold. Dr. Zugaby made another startling finding. The Roman practice of nailing a victim's palm to the cross would have ruptured the median nerve in the hand. This has the effect of turning the victim's thumbs inwards. A careful examination of the shroud reveals that the victim has his thumbs turned inward. They are hidden underneath the palms, just as one would expect if the median nerve had been ruptured. That was extremely accurate. The thumb had been pulled in. It's like missing on the Shroud of Torn. The ruptured median nerve was far from the only clue that Dr. Zugaby's investigation found on the Shroud. Looking at the face, it was not symmetrical, showing evidence of a beating. I looked at the angulations of the blood in the head region where the crown of thorns was. The blood flows going along where the muscles will contract and they had a corkscrew appearance. The blood shows a flow in the back of the hand and it runs nicely along the side and it accumulates a pool. I've seen it in many, many cases of injuries to the hand in the medical examiner's office. From this wealth of data, Dr. Zugaby came to one overwhelming conclusion about the image on the shroud. From the forensic pathology point of view, it is totally consistent with a crucified individual. I have no doubts at all. But even if Dr. Zugaby was right, his work could not answer the fundamental question that might tie the shroud to Jesus of Nazareth. How old was it? That could only be resolved if the Pope would allow scientists to cut a piece of cloth from the shroud to carbon date it. There was this real tension, this real controversy as to whether this should be subjected to the scientific test. Since carbon dating meant actually destroying part of the shroud, it was an enormous step for the church to take. Those results would cause people to rethink everything they knew about the Shroud of Turin. In 1978, a team of international scientists calling themselves the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STIRP, proved that the image on the Shroud of Turin was not a drawing or painting. The result convinced many of the faithful that they were indeed looking at the face of Christ. But if the Shroud was the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, the linen would have to be 2,000 years old. The only way to prove that was to cut a section from the shroud to carbon date it, a process that could accurately identify the age of the linen to within 30 years. In 1988, scientists lobbied for access a second time, but unknown to them, Pope John Paul II was already consulting with his own scientific advisors and had reached a decision. I was in Rome at the time, and there was this real tension, this real controversy as to whether this should be subjected to the scientific test. I mean, if this is the burial shroud of Jesus, is that not an indignity to what is the only physical link to the Savior? And others would say, well, look, if this is a fraud, we need to know one way or another. And John Paul II, to his credit, and the Vatican, to its credit, said, no, we're going to put this to the knife, literally. The first step in any carbon dating process is to burn or combust the material being tested. Cutting a piece from the shroud that would be permanently destroyed was a highly controversial action, so the sample was cut from a corner that was already severely damaged. 
It was a convenient choice. It was an in the area of a cloth that nobody was going to complain about. Nobody was going to take issue with the fact that they're pulling threads from the more pristine parts of, of the cloth. The section removed from the damaged corner was divided into four separate samples. One piece of the shroud was sent to Oxford University, another to the Swiss Institute of Technology in Zurich, and two smaller pieces were sent to the University of Arizona, where Dr. Tim Jill was a member of the original carbon dating team. Everybody and all the plants and all the animals on the surface of this planet have approximately the same amount of carbon-14 in them as long as they're alive. When we die, the C14 in our bodies decays with a known decay rate. If we measure the carbon-14 in the sample and compare it to a standard, we can calculate the age from the ratio of the sample to the standard. First, the shroud sample was cleaned of any impurities. Then, it was literally burned up. We start off with a piece of linen and we combust it at this end, turning the carbon of that sample into a gaseous state. The CO2 gas is then solidified and turned into graphite or pure carbon. Each graphite sample is shot through an accelerating mass spectrometer, which can then count each individual carbon-14 atom. This particle detector can count one atom at a time. For a modern sample, we count upwards of 100 atoms per second. For an old sample, one that's close to 50,000 years, we may count five or 10 atoms in two minutes. From the number that passed through, scientists are able to accurately find a date. For the Shroud of Turin test, each lab worked secretly and independently of the other, and yet each came up with the same range of dates. We wanted to make sure we were right, so we measured it more times than we would regularly, and we knew that it wouldn't be 2,000 years old after five minutes. The Shroud of Turin turned out to be a medieval sample from the 14th century, and that's what the radiocarbon date shows. The Shroud was dated between 1260 and 1390. The carbon dating was a stunning revelation, making headlines around the globe. The scientific facts were in. The Shroud of Turin could not be the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. STIRP member Ray Rogers had always been open-minded about the authenticity of the shroud, but he was a man of science, and in his view, this was final, conclusive evidence that the shroud was a fake. Despite this evidence, many faithful continued to believe that the shroud of Turin was real, but their beliefs were dismissed by the broader scientific community especially by scientists like Ray Rogers. I'd been reading these things by people from the lunatic fringe who were explaining why the date was wrong. I was irritated and just uh, getting mad. I don't have any faith at all in somebody who says, I think I see flowers on the shroud or I think I see little sailing ships sailing along. Well, I don't have much faith in that. What Ray Rogers did believe in were conclusions based on hard scientific evidence. But the pragmatic man of science was about to get the shock of his professional life. The carbon dating of the Shroud of Turin in 1988 concluded that it was not the 2,000-year-old burial shroud of Jesus of Nazareth, but a fake dating only as far back as the 1300s. Ray Rogers and the Stirp team had ruled out the shroud was a painting or dyed relief. But it was still a mystery how the image had gotten there. And that sliver of doubt was enough for many to keep the faith. There are people who are so emotionally involved in this that they're not going to accept any scientific result. Their faith is not going to be shaken by some pointy-headed scientist. Sue Benford and her husband, Joe Marino, are among those who believe the shroud is real. I had never heard of the shroud before, 1997. I was flipping channels and saw the face on the TV. 
And um, there was something very unknowing that I had, that that was really Jesus' face. Benford says that this vision inspired them to find proof that the carbon dating results were wrong. Both acknowledge that they are not scientists and that they have no scientific background or accreditations. Sue runs a small not-for-profit that advocates for the humane use of animals in scientific research. Joe works in an Ohio State University library. And yet, they may have uncovered the clue that will finally solve this mystery. Look here. Nowhere else is there this definitive, intentional dark green. Working out of her home with photos taken by the 1978 Sturk team, Benford noticed something strange about the area where the carbon dating samples had been taken. The herringbone weave that is so consistent throughout the main body of the shroud seemed misaligned, off axis. Our theory is that there's a mixture of 16th century cloth and 1st century cloth, and the data that we're finding on the cloth matches that theory. Benford and Marino argue the carbon dating is wrong because the section from where the samples were taken had been contaminated with fibers from a later date. According to this theory, cotton from the 16th century was invisibly woven into the linen fibers of the shroud. A fixer was applied to the patched area, and the repair was expertly dyed so that it would be invisible to the naked eye. It is a craft they contend was called French reweaving. When you do this type of French reweaving, um, you're not just stitching two pieces of material together and that would give you all of one and all of the other. It's more like this. The ends are unraveled in the main cloth. The ends are unraveled in the patch. They are spliced together and the threads are connected and interwoven so you see literally an interweaving such that you have old and new on both sides of the equation. Well, I'm skeptical when I'm listening to this, but they had taken photographs that were available of the samples taken for the carbon dating. And they had submitted these to several textile experts who didn't know they were looking at a photograph from the shroud. And each of these textile experts, independent of each other, said, you know, this looks rewoven. The samples taken for radiocarbon dating were cut from one corner of the shroud adjacent to a seam. It was effectively an area that was damaged by someone cutting a piece out of it, possibly to sell as relic, so it needed to be repaired. So when the C14 samples were taken, you're gonna have a lot of in-mixing on both sides. So unless you actually took one thread and did them individually, you wouldn't get a first century or a 16th century. You'd get, you know, guess what? Something around 12 to 1400. Benford went looking for statistical anomalies in the carbon dating results that would confirm a mixture of old and new threads. What she discovered was an incredible pattern that could not be explained away as coincidence. If you look at their unpublished data now, Arizona had some of the oldest dates at 1238 and the youngest at 1430. And you think, were they really 200 years off in their lab? Well, perhaps it's because of material they took from they're both of their different sides. Now we don't know that for sure and they haven't confirmed that, but that's interesting. Oxford is the next oldest and they're the, the closest to, to this side with the most main first century material. Zurich is in the middle and guess what? They have the middle amount and they have the middle date. In 2000, Benford and Marino presented a paper in Orvieto, Italy, detailing their theory that medieval cotton had been introduced into the damaged corner of the shroud. Not surprisingly, it was immediately dismissed by the scientific community. One scientist in particular was outraged. One of the things Ray had a problem with was the fact these weren't scientists, and he didn't take them very seriously. I think he glumped us in with the lunatic friend at that time, and probably for many times <laughs> beyond that. I had given up on the shroud, and this was about the same time that the lunatic fringe were coming up with an infinite number of ways the date could be wrong, and this was just the last straw. 
I got a call from Ray, and he goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> this is nonsense. I can prove these people wrong in five minutes. And I said, well, Ray, go for it. But when Ray Rogers went into his lab, he was shocked by what he found. In his opinion, Sue Benford and Joe Marino were right. In 1988, science declared that it was impossible for the Shroud of Turin to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. It was only 700 years old. Sue Benford and Joe Marino offered the first real challenge to the carbon dating results. They believed that they had proved the carbon dating wrong because the section from where the samples were taken had been tainted with 16th century cotton fibers. Chemist Ray Rogers, an original STIRP member, thought the Benford Marino theory was wildly implausible. He just didn't buy it. He said, that's nonsense. That's not, it can't be true. He was the gunfighter of STIRP. He was one of those guys that if he didn't like what you were saying, he'd have pulled out his six shooter and fired off six before he had a chance to take a breath. He was not very tolerant, especially of people doing bad science. It sounds far-fetched. I mean, it does sound extremely convenient. You know, I didn't believe it myself when I came up with it. Rogers was in a unique position to confirm or dismiss Benford and Marino's theory. Ray had in his possession from 1978 the tape samples lifted from the surface of the shroud. But remember, those were not big fibers. Those were fibrils taken from the surface. He also had some samples that were taken from the shroud by Professor Reyes, who took samples in 1973 from a corner that was immediately adjacent to the area taken for carbon dating. What few realized was that Ray Rogers was in a race against time. He was losing a long battle with cancer. His old friend, Barry Schwartz, recorded this interview to ensure Ray could recount in his own words what he did next. So I read their paper and I thought, I've got the samples that can shoot that full of holes. So I got out the Ross samples and I got out the, uh, the shroud samples and I went to work again. A couple hours later, he calls me and he goes, boy, he says, I can't believe it. He says, they were right. There's cotton here. He says, there's no cotton in the rest of the shroud, but there's cotton interwoven here. They must be right. No one was more shocked than Rogers himself. His initial observation seemed to confirm Benford and Marino's hypothesis. But he knew to be absolutely certain he needed to examine the threads that were carbon dated. Until I could get a sample from the real radiocarbon cloth, a documented sample, you know, I couldn't prove anything. The carbon dating process destroys the sample as part of the dating procedure. But all the labs involved in 1988 had held on to a small sample as a reserve. The authentic radiocarbon sample that I got, these segments of yarn were cut from the middle of the radiocarbon sample, so there was no question about them. And when I looked at these samples from the radiocarbon area, there was no problem at all finding cotton in them. Rogers was now convinced that Benford and Marino had been right. In fact, he found other evidence they had missed which proved the shroud had been repaired with cotton fibers in exactly the section where the carbon dating samples had been taken. If you happen to hit a place where a yarn segment from the original shroud was spliced into the new uh, reweave part, the splice very definitely shows the new yarn that was being put in and dyed to match. The only thing in the shroud that was dyed or stained was this uh, radiocarbon area. So my hypothesis at the moment is that this was done on purpose to fool your eye. Rogers also returned to Stirp's 1978 experiments to see if there was anything the carbon dating labs had overlooked. And when we went back and looked at the ultraviolet photographs, here is this area that's significantly darker, it doesn't fluoresce as much, and it's just this area that, uh, around the raw sample and where the radiocarbon sample was cut. And if they had looked at any of the photographs that we had and studied the information we had as of 1978, 
they would have known that that was the worst possible place they could have taken a sample. Had somebody paid attention to my photographs of 78 and other data that we gathered, they would have chosen a different area. My conclusion is that that area was manipulated. It was done by somebody with great skill and different materials than were used to make the shroud. In 2005, just five weeks before losing his battle with cancer, Rogers published the last paper of his distinguished career. He did not call into question the science of the carbon dating labs. In fact, he believed they were accurate, but only for the damaged section of the shroud. In his opinion, the results told us nothing about the true age of the main body of the shroud. But, to his great frustration, he also discovered another carbon dating test might not be possible. In 1988, a carbon dating test concluded the Shroud of Turin was only 700 years old. It had been dismissed as a hoax. But what if that was wrong? What if, as Sue Benford and Joe Marino argue, the dating had been tainted by the presence of medieval fibers? If they're right, then the Shroud of Turin might just be what the faithful believe it to be. I don't believe in miracles, no way. At the end of his life, Ray Rogers had been pulled back into his lab by Benford and Marino's theory. To his astonishment, he found himself agreeing with them. I'm coming to the conclusion that it has a very good chance of being the piece of cloth that was used to bury the historic Jesus. He writes a paper that's accepted for publication in Thermochemica Acta, January of 2005. And that paper is the only peer-reviewed science that challenges the carbon date with anything credible up until that point in time. Rogers was perhaps the only person who could confirm this theory, as he had access to fibers from both the main body of the shroud and the carbon-dated section. He also knew from his own experiments in 1978, the shroud was free of any pigments or dyes. And yet, when he looked at threads from the corner where the carbon dating samples had been cut, that's exactly what he found. Dyes, gums, resins, all signs that this section had been repaired hundreds of years ago. You've got photomicrographs that demonstrate this very clearly. The cotton fibers from the radiocarbon sample are fairly heavily coated with the gum dye mordant, and some of the linen fibers don't show any of that at all. They look just as slick as anything, and it didn't stick to them. Here's the whole crux of it. Linen is very difficult to dye, and it ages as time goes on, so it's colored. So in order to match a reweaving with the original color, you have to use cotton and you dye the cotton. Ray found some waxes on those samples that suggested to him that the threads were from a so-called invisible reweaving process. But Rogers knew that his findings needed to be tested with equipment far more advanced than he had had in his home lab. I was given this assignment by a dying man, and, and I wanted to complete what he had hoped for. Bob Villarreal was a colleague of Rogers at the Los Alamos National Lab. As a dying wish, Rogers asked his friend to independently confirm his findings. It was a race uh, for him because he knew he was dying. He wanted to know, is this corner of the shroud of the same composition whether it was flax or linen or cotton. If it was cotton, it's not the same as the main shroud. But before any tests could be conducted, Ray lost his long battle with cancer on March 8, 2005. He was 78 years old. After Roger's death, Villarreal was determined to confirm his friend's findings. He sent the fibers Ray had given him to a colleague at the Los Alamos lab. Right away, something remarkable happened. I received a call from him and he said, the thread that I was going to analyze broke into two pieces. 
is God going to be mad at me? <laughs> the threads turned out to be two separate pieces woven together, just as Benford and Marino predicted. But even more important was what held them together, a mordant, a gum-like substance used for centuries to set dyes. This finding was a revelation, independent confirmation that this section of the shroud had been dyed. Since Ray Rogers had long ago confirmed there were no dyes on the main body of the shroud, it was now clear the carbon dating samples had been cut from an anomalous part of the shroud. The damaged corner was not like the rest. They come in and they snip, 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 snip in secret and take the worst possible sample they could. The people who certified the sample are still trying to convince everybody that everybody else is wrong, they're right. Those were perfectly valid samples. In the last months of his life, Rogers became a strong advocate for another carbon dating. But sadly, he also believed that this was no longer possible. For even if the age-old problem of access could be solved, there was another much bigger problem, the way the Shroud of Turin had been preserved. Ray Rogers talked about the fact that the box in which the shroud was kept, the reliquary, was treated with thymol, which is a chemical that kills anything alive, bugs, anything, bacteria. That treatment of thymol could impact future carbon dating of the cloth. According to Rogers, by using a plant-based chemical, thymol, to clean the reliquary, they had inadvertently done permanent damage to the shroud. It was now contaminated with modern carbon atoms, making it impossible to accurately date. But before he died, Ray Rogers thought he had found a solution. The shroud had been damaged by fire in 1536, leaving 16 distinct burn marks, marks where samples could be taken. And since they were already pure carbon, they could easily be cleaned of thymol. You got carbon there that's been charred since 1532, and charred cloth is, is very impervious to any kind of attack. So it makes a real good dating sample. And best of all, these charred areas had already been collected from a 2002 restoration of the shroud. In 2002, they removed the backing cloth, they removed all of these patches. You see like this charred area here? She snipped off the charred area from around these burnt holes, and they saved that. That's prime C14 stuff. You could date that. These carbon remnants might hold the key to finally solving the mystery of the Shroud of Turin. Some of Ray's colleagues have submitted a request to the Vatican for access to these burned samples to undertake a second carbon dating. The scientific world awaits another opportunity to find out if the shroud is the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth or an elaborate fake. But whatever the answer, it is almost certain the scientific debate over the Shroud of Turin will go on. If it isn't old enough to be the Shroud of Jesus, then I feel I'll have witnessed a miracle because some medieval guy then will have created something that we can't even duplicate nor can we fully explain, and I'd like to know how that was done.